Thank you, guys. That's wonderful. Thanks so much. Which is one of the best things about having two services. I got to hear that twice. You might need to look in the bulletin for the answer to this question. What is the title of this sermon? Stop. Stop. S-T-O-P. What? S-2-P. You notice a little little extra space in there, right? This sermon title is S-2-P, which means Saul to Paul. Saul to Paul. His name was Saul, but after his experience on the Damascus Road, he was changed to Paul. S to P. Now, it's interesting that the word Paul, the name Paul in Latin, really means stop or cease. And so, I think it's almost prophetic that Saul was stopped on the Damascus Road he ceased to be doing what he was doing, and they, named his, they changed his name to Paul. And the other aspect is that Paul is a good Latin name, and because Paul went out into the Greek Latin world, probably it was best for him to be known by a Latin name rather than a Jewish name like Saul. But he was stopped in his tracks. We first meet Saul... And I'm going to do my very best to call him Saul, at least prior to his meeting Jesus on the Damascus Road, because that's his name at the beginning. We first meet Saul in the story of Acts and the stoning of Stephen. Saul was at the stoning of Stephen. Saul was a brilliant man. Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Saul was a educated orator expert in the law. I want you to understand, he had his PhD, okay? He was somebody, and he was consenting to the death of Stephen because he hated Christ and these Christians. We read about Saul in Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 1. Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 1. It says, And now Saul was consenting to his death, his death being the stoning of Stephen. Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered all throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except to the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That's a very descriptive word, isn't it? He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging out men and women, committing them to prison. Havoc. Dragging them out. This does not seem like a pretty picture. This is a violent picture. And there's this great persecution in Jerusalem. So much so that even though the apostles stay in Jerusalem, still at this point in time, many of the Christian disciples go out away from Jerusalem and go out into various other places And while this is sad in some ways, it also has some very positive benefits because they go out and begin teaching Christ in lots of other places instead of just in Jerusalem. One of the places they went was Damascus. And so, after wreaking havoc in Jerusalem, Paul decides to turn his attention Because of the problems they're hearing coming back from Damascus, Paul decides to turn his attention to Damascus. Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 1. It says, Then Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, 
This is a violent man on a mission to purify the church. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way there, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, the first thing the disciples of Christ were called was not originally Christians. They weren't called Christians till later at Antioch. The first name for the followers of Jesus were the followers of the way. They were of the way. And of course, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, this was the first name for Christians. And Saul gets these letters of authority and letters of introduction. There's a very large Jewish community in Damascus, had been there for many years. And he gets these letters of authority to go to Damascus and find Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem, if necessary, in chains. Verse 3. And, he journe- and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now, Damascus is about 140 miles northeast of Jerusalem. To get to Damascus, you can't just go straight. But you have to kind of go north and then dogleg across because of the terrain. And so when Saul left Jerusalem, he would have gone up through Galilee. Now, there's this interesting Interesting information in the book Acts of the Apostles, that you might enjoy reading this chapter, in which we're told that when Saul is going through Galilee, who lived in Galilee? It's Jesus' home territory. And as he's going through Galilee, Acts of the Apostles says that he begins thinking about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is giving him thoughts about Jesus. Of course, he doesn't want these thoughts about Jesus. But he begins thinking and wondering about Jesus as he's going through Galilee where Jesus had lived. But then he goes past Galilee, gets up into, up into Syria, and back to verse number back to verse number three. It says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. Here's this blinding light. It prostrates him. It incapacitates him. It debilitates him. And he falls to the ground. And he hears a voice. It continues on. And he hears a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's not only the light, but it's Jesus who appears in the light. Now, he has some people with him. He has an entourage with him who are traveling with him. Evidently, they see Saul fall. They see the light, but they might hear a voice, but they don't understand it. Saul's the only one that hears his voice. Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Saul, why are you persecuting me? It continues on in verse 5. And he said, Saul says, Who are you, Lord? Now, just because he calls him Lord doesn't necessarily mean he knows it's Jesus. The, Lord, the word Lord could be a more of a title like sir, okay? So don't necessarily think yet at this point in time that, that, that he's confessed faith in Jesus. Who are you, sir? Who are you, master? And then the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus appears to Saul in the light. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, who is Paul 
See, I said it wrong. Who is Saul persecuting? Christians. But I want you to see that Jesus identifies with his people so much that when you're persecuting a Christian, it's as though you're doing it to Jesus himself. I love that picture. He identifies with his people so much that when you touch one of them, it's as though you're touching him. When Paul put the wrists of a Christian in chains and dragged them off to prison, it's as though he were dragging the body of Jesus himself. That's how much Jesus identifies with his people. With each one of us, individually, every single one of us. There's this wonderful text that kind of parallels this idea back in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 2, verse 8, just in case you have trouble finding Zechariah, it's the second book from the end of the Old Testament. So if you can find Matthew, just go left. Zechariah 2, 8. It's telling about, it's telling about a time when God is going to deliver the, the, the kingdom of Israel and, and Judah. And I'm really interested in the last part of the verse, Zechariah 2, verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after the glories to the nations which plunder you. It's a promise that God's going to deal with the nations that have plundered Israel. But then this verse, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Who does that say you are? You are the apple of his eye. Now, this is a beautiful phrase. I tried to figure out the origin of this phrase, and it's just, I just couldn't figure it out. But you know what the phrase means. Something that's most precious. Something that's the apple of someone's eye is that which they think is the most precious in their life. Their most prized, precious possession. And that is how Jesus feels about you. I think that's exciting. He even feels that way about me. That's exciting. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. When Saul was persecuting the Christians, he was persecuting the apple of Jesus' eye. And that's why he stops him dead in his tracks on the road to Damascus and says, no more, no more. Not going to do it. Why are you persecuting me? And it's not just Saul that I think that text is talking about who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. You know, Satan is the greatest enemy we have. You know, when he brings trials and troubles and tribulations into our lives, it's not as though it's only us. You know, he, I think Satan is so diabolical that he realizes that when he brings problems into our lives, it hurts Jesus. And it brings him double joy because not only is he hurting us, he can hurt the one he hates the most, Jesus himself, by hurting us. That's how much Jesus identifies with us. Peter talks about the same kind of idea over in the book of 1 Peter, back toward the end of the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter's describing the people of God. <clears throat> You've heard this text before. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Peter writes this about Christians. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peter says, you people, you Christians, were once not a nation. You were once not a people, but now you're not only a people, you are God's people. 
And then there's this phrase up earlier. I love this phrase. I'm reading from the New King James Version on this for this sermon. It says that his own special people. I hate to brag. But I am special. And what's so cool about God is God can play favorites with every single one of us. We are all his favorite. That's an amazing thing. Now, the reason I'm reading this from the King James Version today is because in, I'm from the New King James, is because the King James Version says in this verse, you are his own peculiar people. I used to really hate this verse when I was a teenager. If there's one thing I did not want to be as a teenager, it was peculiar. Some of you understand that. I mean, I was peculiar enough. I was a bit of a nerd when I was a teenager. That's before they even knew what the word nerd meant, by the way. It's so old. I didn't want to be peculiar. But I can tell you, I'm really, I'm really happy to tell you I'm special. And that's the way God feels about you and me. We are his special, one-of-a-kind people. We are part of his family. Actually, I have, some of you might have Sprint Telephone. I have Sprint Telephone service. And Sprint Telephone has come out with this new advertising campaign. They used to have the family plan. Now they have the family plan. It's friends and family. So you can get anybody that, even people you don't trust on your phone bill. Why in the world you would put somebody you don't trust on your phone bill? I don't know. But they have this special plan, the family plan. It's unlimited text, unlimited calling, unlimited data for anyone on your, fam- on your family plan. And they think they're doing something really, really up to date. You know, I belong on God's family plan. And I have always had unlimited data. I've always had unlimited calling and unlimited texts. And it's called prayer. It's called the Bible, unlimited data. It's called the Holy Spirit, unlimited texts back calling data I'm happier to be on God's family plan than sprints and I don't have to pay $207 a month <laughs> back to Acts chapter 9 pick, pick up the story again of Saul we have to get back to him because he's kneeling in the dirt on, this, on the road at this point in time. We can't just leave him there. Verse 5, Acts chapter 9, verse 5. And he said, who are you? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? It seems to me that is the question that every single Christian should be asking every single day. Lord, what is it you want me to do? That is the essence of the Christian life. That is the essence of following Jesus. For how can we follow Jesus unless we ask him what he wants us to do? So I think, I I like what Saul does here. Lord, what do you want me to do? And here's the answer. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go to the city and you will be told what to do. What's he tell him? Rise, go to the city and wait. Something I do so well. You too? You know, when you would like to have an answer, wouldn't you like to have an answer? Don't you just hate it when you call a, a business or something and they just, you're on, 
you're on that answering machine forever. Hello, your answer, your, your, your call is important to us. Please hold. 30 minutes later, your call is still important to them. Really? I don't like to wait. You've, you parents who have young children and you parents who used to have young children, you know how much young children like to wait for an answer? Mommy, daddy, I want it now, you know. And, and most of us haven't outgrown that. So go into the city and wait. And it will be told you what you must do. It seems to me, as I said, the essence of the Christian life is first asking each and every day the question of the Lord, what would you have me to do? And the second is waiting to see what his answer is. And that's so hard. Let's be honest. Don't we like to do what we like to do when we like to do it? That's what Paul's been used to doing. He thought he knew what needed to be done. He's been doing what he wanted, what he thought best, what his will dictated. And from this time forward, he was going to have a different boss. Jesus would be telling him what to do instead. And I was thinking how often it is that we get in trouble when we do. Maybe I should say it this way. How often it is that we get in trouble, that I get in trouble, when I just do the things I want to do without saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? We have oftentimes, we're kind of headstrong. We have this I problem, it's what I want to do. And I'm not just talking about relationships between husbands and wives and family members. I'm talking about our relationship with God. Do you know the, the, the center letter of the word sin is I. I is in the middle of pride. I is in the middle of crime. It's not in the middle, but there's an I in selfishness. Iniquity, there's three eyes in there. You know, it's all about me. It's I, I problems. It's what I want to do. And in the Christian life, it's not about what I want to do. What would you have me to do, God? Now, there are certain times when it's perfectly fine what you want to do. In everyday life, there are certain issues of life that if you want to do that, that's, that's your choice. When I was 40 years old, I made a momentous decision in my life. We're sitting down to dinner one night, and my wife has fixed sweet potatoes. She put it on my plate, and I looked at her, and I said, this will be the last sweet potato I ever eat. I don't like sweet potatoes. I have never liked sweet potatoes. I only ate sweet potatoes because in our house, when I was a kid, my mother had the rule, if it's on your plate, you will eat it without questioning. Any of you have a, any of you have a mean mom like that? So I, could, I could eat anything, but I never liked sweet potatoes. And I told my wife, I said, I'm 40 years old. I can decide if I want to eat sweet potatoes or not. That's a decision I can make. But when it comes to spiritual life, it's totally different. You know, one of the Ten Commandments doesn't say thou shalt eat sweet potatoes. I'm really thankful about that. I know some of you love sweet potatoes, and I'm happy for you to love them because there's more for you to eat since I don't eat them. <laughs> but we have this I problem in a spiritual life. It's, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, I know what I want to do. But Lord, what would you have me to do? Because we're rebellious, selfish human beings in our natural selves, we sometimes fall into this pattern of just wanting to do what we want to do. And I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think as, as Americans, sometimes because we cherish freedom and liberty so much that it even makes it harder in our Christian lives. We cherish freedom to do, think, behave, eat, drink, act 
like I want to. We cherish those freedoms. But really what matters is, Lord, what would you have me to do? And Lord, will you please reveal it to me if I wait? There's only one place I is safe. And that is when before I is C-H-R and after I is S-T. The only place I am safe is when I'm surrounded by Christ. And if I am hidden in the middle of my relationship with Christ, there is no I in surrender to Jesus. If I'm hidden in the middle of my relationship with Christ, I am going to be okay. What changed Saul on that road to Damascus? It was a vision of Jesus and a a revelation of what God's plans were for his life. Now, he didn't know it yet. But God was going to rock his world. He's led into, into Damascus by his friends. You'll be told what you must do. Well, we have to pick the story up because it gets exciting, as though, as though it wasn't already exciting. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 8, 18. Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And Ananias said, here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. The short version of this passage is God comes to Ananias and Ananias says, say what? You know who this is, God? Lord, come on. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went went on his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, I love that. He doesn't call him bad names. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you come, as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight once more, and he arose and was baptized. Wow. I didn't have this kind of a conversion experience, but I'm so excited to read about what happened with Paul. By the way, Ananias is one of my least known heroes for doing what God told him to do. I mean, for all they knew, of course, Jesus is telling them this, but for all the Christians knew, he's a spy. So Ananias is is doing what Jesus told him to do by going to Saul. Whenever we discover in our Christian lives, the goal of our Christian lives should be to discover what Jesus wants us to do and wait until he reveals that to us. Lord, what do you want me to do? Wait. I'm convinced if we wait, he will reveal it to us. And that's one of the key thoughts, one of the key faith lessons I take from this story of the conversion of Paul. Oh, the changes that occurred on the Damascus road that day. Think about Saul before and Paul after. 
Saul is leading a delegation of authority to Damascus. But Paul has to be led because he's blinded. Saul sees clearly that Jesus is an imposter. And then he's blinded. But Paul, who still has scales over his eyes, finally sees the truth about Jesus. Saul is going to Damascus to put the Christians in chains. But Paul leaves Damascus a slave to Jesus and ultimately will be put in chains for his cause. Saul is going to Damascus to arrest the Christians, but Paul is arrested by the risen, by the vision of the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he becomes, he dedicates his life to doing what Jesus tells him to do. It's a small change alphabetically from S to P. But what a world of difference it made in his life. Just imagine the changes that God can make in your life and all the difference it might make to you. My challenge to you today. We're going to sing just the first and last verse in number 422, Marching to Zion.